Hey everyone, this is the Recovery Playbook. This is where we focus on entrepreneurs, people in recovery, and people who use tools for mind, body, and spirit enhancement. And today we have James Swigert, who is an author, an entrepreneur, and a film production executive. He has been sober 30 years. He's been in the production business... 25, 30 years. 25, 30 years. I want to introduce you to James, my friend. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great today. Good, Thanks good. for having me up. I want to jump right into it. Let's do it. What is this little baby? This what is uh, tell me about this. this. This is my book, if you say so, my story and how I changed it to save my life. And it's a book that just came out October fifteenth. Uh, it's available on Amazon, paperback, hardcover, Audible, and ebook. And um, this is actually it's a, it's it's really a collection of um, not only thirty years of recovery, but fifty five years of my time on this planet. And it's really about my journey uh, and, and it really focuses on the power of the spoken word. Mm -hmm. How what we say really indicates and dictates how our lives are going to be and how we're gonna feel and who we're going to become ultimately. So it's really a, a, a deep dive into uh, the kind of the first of the four agreements by mm -hmm. Don Miguel Ruiz mm -hmm. of be impeccable with your yep. word, only speak in the direction of truth and love, never speak against yourself or others. It's really a book about self-care. Mm -hmm. It's really a book about self-care and, um, and, and kind of the events that happened to me when I was very young that were very traumatic to me. Yeah. And then subsequently the stories that I told as a result of those events. So from the abandonment and the abuse came I don't matter, I don't right. count, I'm unlovable. And those are stories, old stories that just aren't true, yep. that I looped into my head well into my recovery. And so it's about recognizing that you have a story that's not true, realizing that first off, and then realizing that it's not, you're making adult decisions based on misinformation, because those old stories are lies. Right. And so it's about changing the story. So how do I create a new story from that? And then, um, you know, it's, it's really the universe will give you whatever story you tell it. Mm. So whatever vibration you put out, you get back. Absolutely. And we know those people, right? Yeah, absolutely. They're, uh, you know, the phone screen <laughs> is completely shattered. Yeah. They're late for work. The computer doesn't work and the car's broken down and we're never going to make it. Yep. And they never make it. Yep. And thusly, and I've been getting some great feedback on the book, a lot of great comments sure. where people are just starting to reframe how they speak about themselves. And they're already feeling lighter and they're feeling shifts because they're able to change that conversation of, you know, and, 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 and we all do it. And it's those stories you tell yourself in the dark mm. when you're tired or you're sick, you're not feeling well, mm. ah, yeah. they're gonna figure me out or I'm not good enough. The shoe's gonna drop. Exactly. And so it's about catching yourself. And, and when you are ready to hear this message, there's an open-mindedness about it where uh, you're able to not believe everything you think. Mm -hmm. That's the first step. I actually, I was beating myself up about something one day many, many years ago. And this friend of mine, Kurt, a friend of mine in recovery, I called him up and he said, sit down, get out a piece of paper, grab a pen, write down what I say. Do not believe everything you think and then he hung up on me so i was just sitting there staring at what i had just written because i was believing something that just absolutely wasn't true and that's what snapped me out of it and i went oh my god yeah if you say so mm -hmm. and so it works to the negative right the power of the spoken word i mean adolf hitler almost destroyed yeah. a race of people using the negative power of the spoken word so it's got mighty power yeah. but what if conversely we can wield that in in, in our favor, in, in the spirit of positivity, right? In the spirit of success, fulfillment, and not only that for ourselves, for personal fulfillment and success, but for the success of others. Because that's really what happened, and in the, in, in the book opens with this story where I discovered my gift of being able to, to be a, a life cheerleader, if you will. Because yeah. someone said, oh, you're like a life coach. I said, no, I'm more like a life cheerleader. Yeah. Because you already have the playbook inside you I'm just here to help you run the plays, crack the playbook yeah, open yeah. so you can win the game. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, and so that's really, that's really kind of the essence of the book. It's really about just changing the story so that we can actually 
real quick, with Achieve. 30 years of yeah. sobriety, at what year did you go, I got a book inside me? I knew it for quite some time. I've been writing okay. since before uh, my recovery. Uh, I've always been a writer and writing down my thoughts and my ideas and my humor and, and painting and drawing. So I've always had, had, had a visual expression of my thoughts and feelings. And I, I, when you read the book, you realize my, my family life was very complicated. I'm the youngest of uh, seven, and my mom remarried a guy with five, so I was the youngest of 12 kids. And with the two parents, there were, you know, whatever, 14 of us living in a three-bedroom house. It was chaotic and pandemonium. And I tried to write about my family, and I, I, was, I was having a hard time because there were some really painful memories there. And I didn't want to really hurt anybody who was sure. still, still around. And then I also tried to write about this concept uh, which I use in the book, it's the train metaphor, where when I started working with young guys in recovery, I started sponsoring almost immediately. And, um, uh, you know, my sponsor said, hey, if you've worked the first step, you can, you can take somebody through it. And so he one pushed step me ahead right of them, away. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, they pushed yeah. me through the steps. Yeah. So, that's, yeah, that's a pretty good So what I was able to do is, is uh, uh, you know, in addition to, 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 to the 12-step format, I was able to also kind of bring some of the other things that I had learned um, to my recovery when young men are getting sober or older men for that matter and that's just kind of like okay what am I do what do I do now and and it's okay great well as I say in the book the longest journey you can make is from your head to your heart mm. to figure out okay get to get to my soul's desire mm -hmm. what am I here to do for the rest of my life and so I liken that passion that your soul's desire as this fire inside of you and so what what I used was this train metaphor of this steam engine locomotive that that furnace in the steam engine locomotive is your passion. It's your soul's desire. And so when we get when we get clean and sober, the fire's out. There's just a little whisper of smoke there. And so the idea that what now mm -hmm. is is that okay? It's time to put on your overalls and grab the shovel and get bloody knuckles mm -hmm. and covered in soot and start sweating right. and start throwing coal into that fire. And so I call it shoveling coal, right. which is the work that we do on a daily basis in order to maintain our recovery and to move forward in the direction of our dreams while subsequently helping others. And then the, the train metaphor works nicely in that you have the baggage car, yep. which some of us spent too much time in the baggage yep. car. Some of us <laughs> like to live there, yep. uh, in which case your train's not going anywhere. Yep. Uh, some of us spent too much time in the bar car. Yep. Uh, there's, you know, there's the, the observation car. There's the, you know, there's the, the caboose where you can reflect upon your travels. And some people stand there, right? And just, oh, the couldas, wouldas, and shouldas, mm -hmm. especially when you get older in life. Yeah. And you're just, you missed out on something. But the whole thing is I tell who, you know, guys at any age that I work with, get up there and start shoveling coal. Let's get that train moving. So those, the train tracks are your, your life's, plan, your, your destiny, God's will for you, however you want to describe that. And so that's the journey, right? There's no destination. And so, you know, we can stop in at train stations and this is what you and I are doing now, right? It's like, hey, look how your train runs. Look how mine runs. Let's share a little yeah. bit about how we're, how we're keeping our trains running. But really most of the time we need to be, you know, shoveling coal, which is doing the work we need to do uh, to go to meetings, to, to brush our teeth, yeah. to go to the gym, prayer and meditation, all those things that we do just to keep the train running. And, and so, uh, but that's where, you know, and that's our 10,000 hours or whatever we want to be good at, right? Yeah. Um, you know, there's this new, this whole new conversation about flow and how when you're in the flow, which is the natural state of, of, of a lot of high performers that you see, like the Elon Musks and the Jeff Bezos of the world and the Bill Gates of the world or the Kobe Bryants and the Tom Brady's of the world, where these people are in the flow. And, and you can actually compact your 10,000 hours into 5,000 hours hours if you're in the flow which is being in the zone like just you know doing what we got to do in early recovery or in our lives to get flat with the universe got it. that's what I call it just getting flat with the universe clean up your mess yep. and then how do we live clean yep. you know and then when you're in when, when you've when you've got that behind you and that's in the rearview mirror you know my chin comes up a quarter inch because I have self-esteem because I'm doing esteemable acts and I'm doing what I ought to be doing and then I can go, okay, so then what else am I here to do, right? And, and, you know, when you look at a guy like Tom Brady, who's throwing darts to Julian Edelman and going to the Super Bowl six times, he's not questioning his career choice. Yeah, yeah. He's, Is he? He's found his passion. Yeah, for sure. Let me, let me just back up a little bit because I, I think it's essential that the people who watch this podcast, a lot of them are going to be newcomers to recovery. Okay. 
What was your playbook that first year of sobriety? Like, you know, from, from the time you were day one, rock bottom, whatever that looks like, to did you do 90 meetings in 90 days? I mean, just walk me through that first year of things you hung on to that, that got you that first year of sobriety. Great question. Yeah. For me, it was, I didn't have a treatment center, I didn't have money, I didn't have insurance, I didn't go uh, to a sober living or anything like that. I, I literally uh, found myself after a suicide attempt in 12-step meetings. And uh, I had no place to go, which is a great recipe for success. If, you, if, you're, if you're broke down, hurting, and you're not sure how you're gonna get out of the hole you're in, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, it's a great recipe for success and recovery. And that's where I was. I had no place to go. And, and, and so that was, that was the first advantage, the gift of desperation. Then it was really just about being open-minded and listening okay. and trusting. These people obviously had a little sparkle in their eye. Yep. They were laughing, yeah. and I hadn't laughed in a long time. And I wanted what they had, which was just to be able to laugh again. So that was the really simple part. So, you know, I would say finding the humor okay. and the levity in it all. And as you and I know, we have an old timer that says light, lighten the light, F light, up. Lighten the F up, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you know, don't take yourself so seriously. You know, I take the disease very seriously, but I don't take myself so seriously these days. I try not to. Um, but that was really what that first year was. And it was, I didn't do 90-90 because I just, I was, I was, I was working and that couldn't happen. But, but uh, uh, I just, every free moment, you know, I found myself there and I found myself listening and, and following direction. That's what I did is I just followed direction. I, I tried to do a lot less talking and more listening. And especially to people with time that had experience with being sober for long periods of time. And that's, that was really the recipe to my success for that first year. Cool. Um, you're a very successful producer in terms of uh, content, film, commercials, promos. Um, been in the entertainment business for two decades. How has your recovery helped that success? How has my recovery helped the success of my, I mean, <laughs> in every way. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's all connected. Everything's connected. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, I mean, it's really about my morning routine. Okay, tell me about Prayer, that. Prayer, meditation, uh, you know, working out hard, pushing myself to work out hard and break a sweat yep. uh, three times a week at the minimum. So it's really about, uh, and then my prayer consists of reminding me who I am, asking for the universe's direction for me and awareness and, and then getting, yeah, and then getting the, you know, I have a saying that, uh, uh, you know, when we take a step in the direction of our dreams and we're tethered to this spiritual way of life, yeah. body, mind, and spirit, yep. the universe will move shit around for us. Mm. And the power, you know, the obstacles in front of us are never greater than the power behind us. And that's that saying that, that so many of my, my guys hang on to that saying because I'm like, because sometimes you just feel like I'm just, where's, well, I'm all alone out here. And we're not, we're just simply not. And it takes a while to get that spiritual connection, but it's, it's all connected. And so, you know, uh, trying to practice spiritual principles in all my affairs means in business as well. And I used to think that I had to be the tough guy or be the yeller and be firm and rigid and blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, exactly. Yeah. And it's all that does is get you alone in a corner office. Yeah. You know, and so that's not leadership. Yeah. You know, anybody who's trying to, to, to lead by fear and intimidation is not a leader at all. And uh, they're a tyrant, they're a dictator. And, and, and especially today's workforce, uh, that's not, no one, people don't respond to that positively. And so what I found myself doing, and actually the greatest tip I learned in business, I learned from my late dog trainer, uh, who you knew as well, Jonathan Klein. Yeah, and Jonathan Klein helped me train my dog, and and uh, um, you know his whole thing was about positive reinforcement. He said, if you want a great dog that'll be loyal and follow your every command, it's about positive reinforcement. And we're all, you know, we got hair on us, Greg. <laughs> a little bit more or less than, than others, but, but we have hair on us. We're animals, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. We are. We have, we, we have reason and you know, rationality and spirituality to our benefit, but we're still animals. And so we're going to make mistakes. We are going to you know, err. And so uh, you know, it's, it's really about uh, um, uh, realizing that you know, we, we, there's, there's work to do to, to tap into that energy and, uh, but, but going back to the universe moving stuff around, when you set foot in a direction and all of a sudden things start to appear, that's when stuff happens. 
You know, that's when stuff happens. And, and, and so going back to my dog and this train, so if I come home and smack my dog because he chewed my shoe, yeah. he doesn't know why I'm smacking him because he chewed the shoe five hours yeah, ago. Exactly. You know, and he's not connecting those things. Okay. And so when he so what Jonathan said to me, he goes, put your shoes in the damn closet because that's where they belong okay. and leave chew toys out. They're appropriate for him to chew. Yeah. And when he's doing that, you positive reinforcement. You pet him. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. As a result, I have one of the most phenomenal dogs who I think you got to yeah, meet when you were over Duke. at the house. Duke's <laughs> amazing. And he's incredibly uh, loving, but he's also, uh, you know, uh, he's well trained and he's respectful. Not that my employees are dogs. <laughs> I was going to bring that up. They sometimes some, work. some of your employees may be watching this. And be like, they, hey. know the, they know the metaphor I use. And they understand it. But it's like they work. They work like dogs sometimes. So they work really hard. But we, we, I love what I do, and I love everyone I do it with. And the same thing with my team. My, my, my staff is more like a family. Everyone works really, really hard. But that's the thing is they'll, they'll take a bullet for me. Because you know, I'm not quick to point out you know mistakes or slight. We're human. We're going to make an error, right? It's errors. And so, but what I do is is like even the smallest thing, I'll acknowledge and recognize that person and bring it to everyone's attention at group level on a staff meeting. And really, uh, I really like to celebrate little successes. And that's being that life cheerleader. And people, you know, and Dale Carnegie wrote the, the the book, you know, how to win friends and influence people, which sounds like an evil title. But I think he was just trying to get all the, the scumbags in Washington and Wall Street to read it, to learn how to be nice to people. Because yeah. really, that's what people, all people want is to be heard yeah. and feel respected. Yeah. That's all any of us want. And so, it's, so bringing that all around to self-care and self-love, right? Because right. nobody's harder on me than I am. No, that's true. That's true. You know? So uh, a few words that I always, that always come up in recovery whether it's childhood trauma or eating disorder or uh, PTSD or, or, or alcoholism or addiction is, is um, I'm gonna throw the three words out. You just pick one of them. Shame, resentment, forgiveness. Which, which one do you feel that you can speak really clearly on to give, to give my audience a message of, of, of how to either, how to get over shame, how to, how to fight through resentment or how to, how to learn how to forgive? Well, they're all connected. They are all connected, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. So, I'll, I'll, I, yes, yeah. and I can speak to that. And I would love to thank you. And uh, so, as, as essentially, and I wrote about it in my book because I was a victim of sexual abuse. And obviously, it brought, brought out a lot of anger, especially as an adult man and realizing that people, there were people that knew about it, adults that weren't protecting the children. And so, as a result, I got very, very angry when all this stuff came out and I started to, had to face it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, my first words were, I will never, ever forgive that man. Mm. I was sure I was going to go to my grave with that yeah, for sure. resentment. For sure. And, and my fiance, Elizabeth, was phenomenal. And she really helped me go find a place, the Hoffman Process up in yeah. Northern California, where I was able to go for Great seven place. days, yeah. cracked me open. And I was able to get to the forgiveness of realizing that forgiveness isn't about letting anyone else off the hook. It's about letting ourselves off the hook. Mm. And then I was able to realize and set that person free. Again, Don Miguel Ruiz, who's, who's kind of one of my mentors mm -hmm. for all of this, yeah. what I believe and think, and you know, second of the four agreements is don't take anything personally. Hard one. Mm -hmm. But it will also set you free and transform your life because that guy, that was that dude's trip, right? Any, anyone and anybody, any, anything that anyone else is doing to us perceivedly, is actually it's a reflection of their trip and what they've got going on and 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 and, and you just can't take things personally because they're doing it to whoever's in the room and so when i'm able to detach from making it so personal then i'm able to get crawl out from under that shame and, and the shame lives in the baggage car right it's the dark little musty corner of the baggage car those ones that you don't want to throw out because they're really heavy and 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 that uh that is the shame is the subtle foe I think that's that's advanced recovery when you can dig in there and, and really get start to shed the light on something. Yeah, I call stuff. I call it unpacking the backpack of shame. Yeah, you know, and that backpack gets heavy over the years, and you got to unpack it, and you got to have people who are willing to listen to that shame, you know, and help you with it. And you have to you have to process it. You have to you know, some people think, oh, well, I'll just go shovel coal. I'm like, no, when you're in the baggage car, you've got to process that stuff before you throw it off the train. Well, I got to tell you, I, I've told you this story before. You, you told a story one time when you shared about uh, the nine-year-old little boy. And you went back to Sacramento and you went to a bridge or a tunnel or somewhere. The bridge. And, the bridge. And you prayed yeah. for the nine-year-old little version of you. Mm -hmm. And I had an eight-year-old version of me back in Arizona. 
And the next time I went to Arizona, I did the very same thing. And so that was a tool you gave me probably five or six years ago that I have passed on to many men that we got to go back and pray for those, those boys that, you know, we, we had adults take advantage of us. And, um, and that shame was heavy. That backpack is heavy until we decide to unpack it. And let yourself off the hook. And let yourself off the hook. Absolutely. And that's so free. But I'm very yeah. grateful for you for that one tool because that tool has been passed along to other men. And that's what we do, I think, in, in the work we do. is uh, It's sharing, right? It's just talking absolutely. story. It's sharing good stories that help and, us and, instead and of the negative stories. Absolutely. And they, say, they yeah. say, you know, when you share your pain, you cut your pain in half. And when you share your joy, you double your joy. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'll ask you two more questions. Uh, what tools are you using today? That are All of them. Well, I know, but give me, give me some new tools, like something you just picked up six months ago or a year that, 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 you, that maybe you were like, I don't want to try that, or I, I want to, uh, but you took contrary action, you started doing it, and it's paid off for you. I will tell you one of the most important ones, and this is good for people today, because I think it's easy to get sidetracked with the political circus yeah, in our country absolutely. right now. And sure. so watching the news or watching too much of the news, or I'm going to jump on the Drudge Report, or I'm going to jump on CNN, or I'm going to go over here to Huffington Post, or I'm going to go over here to yeah. Fox, or wherever you get it. Uh, I found myself needing to temper my intake mm. and my inputs. And so uh, what I tell a lot of my guys that come to me with that, like, oh, the, the world's ending. It's not ending. It's just changing. Always has been, always will be. Mm. I say, go to Reuters, which is the most centrist, middle, mm -hmm. not left, not so mm -hmm. much right. It's very middle, and they're just trying to report mm -hmm. the facts. Go to, go to Reuters for five minutes in your day. You'll get all the news you need. If there's an earthquake in Los Angeles, we'll know about it soon enough. You know what I mean? And so it's it, because people get glued to it and they go back and like, I want to see if he's getting impeached or I want to yeah, see yeah. if it's, sure. uh, you know, so-and-so is getting. And, and the thing is, it, it's crazy making. And so what I have to do is I have to temper that. And what I found is that in the morning, I have a morning playlist on Pandora that's all super positive. And I actually, if you go to my website, jamesswigert.com, I'm, I'm posting it there. So people can tap into that and just right off the bat, it starts with uh, uh, um, happy from Despicable Me, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's just Pharrell just talking about being happy. And it's just, I gotta, I've got to take control of what's going into this thing. You know what I mean? And because and, if it's all negative, what's going to come out? Noise. So I've got to have positive in, and then I can have, then positive will come out. And so I've got to I've got to temper. So that's the tool I've I found is, is a positive playlist on on Pandora. To, I start my day with that on the way to the gym. I listen to ten songs that are all super uplift. Even yeah. I have the Tigers in there. Wow, old school, <laughs> you know, wow. old school uh, Survivor, right? Got, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, the band. Exactly. Band. Survivor. I've got, one hit wonder. I've one got one Eminem, Lose Yourself, right? Yeah. These things oh, that yeah. just like I'm, I'm not gonna you know failure's not an option. Got you know it. what I mean? Super uplifting, positive like. You know, uh, to get, kind of get you, get you, get that ship pointed in the right direction towards the beautiful sunset. You know, um, we are big proponents of legacy. Yeah. What What is your legacy? Teaching self care mm -hmm. and self love. Because we can't love others without that, and I think that that some people are born with a lot of love and nurturing and support and they can go on and be amazing without a lot of obstacles. I think in recovery, we have obstacles that we have to overcome. And uh, it's easy to look out externally at, at a lot of the obstacles we need to overcome. But a lot of what doesn't get addressed, I think is that internal work that needs to happen, that really deep, deep self-care, self-forgiveness, and, 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 and ultimately also finding out, you know, if, there, if, if we have a primary purpose, then there must be a secondary and a tertiary purpose. Yeah. Let's find out what those are. And then, and then step in the direction of your dreams because, you know, everything I want today is downstream. Mm -hmm. I used to think I had to swim upstream against the current and fight and cram a square peg in a round hole to try. And that's just not the way it is, you know? The, everything I want is downstream. And so once I was able to surrender and let go and just kind of go with, get, get to know me and what I love and, and what I want, it started to appear, you know? It, start, it's, it just, it starts to appear. So I have all the love in my life. And so I've, I've been blessed with a really yeah, you got a wonderful good life. life. Say, and, and so, so now I just, now I enjoy helping other people. So I hope, I hope this helps. Awesome. All right, If You Say So by uh, James Weigert. And he is an author, an entrepreneur, a friend, and a very seasoned production executive. And uh, really good stuff. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, for buddy. coming on. Yeah, yeah. It's Thanks good to for see having you. me. Yeah.